Hello, guys. David Burns here. Hello, Beak Squad. How are you tonight? Thanks for joining us on our live stream tonight. We're going to be talking about some things that uh, uh, are going to be like um, kind of like a prophet, going to be fortune telling a little bit tonight. I'm going to be talking about what uh, what we can expect in beekeeping in 2024. Possibly uh, some things that I want to share with you guys tonight you've never thought about. So uh, it may be controversial. Hope not. Might make some of you mad. I don't know. <laughs> we'll see. Uh, looking through the comments. So good to see so many familiar faces with us tonight. Good to have Sherry along with us and Jessica working things as well. So thanks, everybody. And uh, hope your week has been going don't, going pretty good. And uh, not much to do with bees here in Illinois. It's been too cold for that. But bees look like they're tucked away for winter. And I made a video a few days ago. We cracked one open and put a winter bee kind board on it. And uh, boy, they were really loud. They were buzzing when I listened to them. So they're down there tucked away in a nice uh, cluster. Uh, early part of... Um, well, not even winter yet. That's what's really alarming, isn't it? That we're not really into winter yet. And yet bees are, going, my bees have gone so long now with, uh, I think we had our first frost in the first part of October. And uh, so we've gone almost, yeah, we've gone two months now without any foraging, anything at all for bees to do or to go out and receive to, as food. So that's kind of scary. <laughs> it really is, isn't it? I mean, when you think about all the things that bees go out and get when they're foraging during the spring and summer and early fall, and then you think about them going two weeks without anything, or I'm sorry, two months. Oh my gosh. I couldn't go two months without any food. Those poor bees. I feel so sorry for them. Oh gosh. Hello, guys. I see you guys uh, from all over the world tonight. Thanks for joining me. It's good to have you. Um, I'm going to jump right into my uh, ideas tonight about what we can expect, what kind of changes that we might see um, in 2024 with beekeeping. To, uh, to kind of get you up to date on me, if this is your first time to join me or you don't know much about me, I started beekeeping in the early to mid-90s. And uh, about the time the varroa mites really started taking hold in the U.S. But when I started beekeeping, it was a whole different climate. And I know some of you have been around beekeeping a lot longer than I have. I think I've been keeping bees. Uh, let me do the quick math. Uh, I think 28 years from when I started, almost three decades ago. Some of you have been keeping bees longer than you were alive, David. And I'm sure you have. <laughs> but not many of you. I know that not many of you have been. So when I started, I, um, I didn't have anything to go by much. I had uh, the big book, ABC, XYZ, and beekeeping. I kind of read through that. It was a 1930-something edition, way outdated, nothing current, but enough to get me going, right? And um, I had a, a mentor that was a beekeeper, and he would give me information. But compared to what's available today, back then, even, um, did I say 30 years ago almost? Boy, nothing compared to what's available today. And so I, I just think I, 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 I'm amazed at how much information that's available. I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a minute. But um, one of the things I noticed about beekeeping now, and we're going to see more of in 2024, and I did a lot of study. I actually look at uh, Google Trends to see um, the number of searches that are being done on Google uh, related to beekeeping. And I, I went back from uh, all the way back to 2004. Now, I was going to bring those statistics and kind of show them to you, but you know, I don't know. I get bored of statistics. I go to conferences and people throw statistics on the board and I'm like, <laughs> I get bored. I didn't want to bore you. I'll just tell you what it, what it looked like, what it means. There were, there weren't hardly as many, um, searches being done on beekeeping until after 2006 with CCD. Hi, Leah. And uh, Vera is my granddaughter. They're always on there watching me from their television. And I always have to say hi to one of my granddaughters, Vera and Seth and Leah. Thanks for watching, guys. Appreciate it. Always great to be supported by your family. My gosh, if your family doesn't love you, who do you have? <laughs> so you got to acknowledge them. But I, I'll tell you, um, the, the ratio of beekeepers that were doing searches 
uh, prior to CCD compared to what happened immediately after CCD was astounding. And uh, on Google, people that would just go on and on Google and type in beekeeping, honeybees, something like that, started growing rapidly after about 2007, continued to grow pretty strong, and it even grew more, guess what year, 2020. So during the uh, pandemic, a lot of people were looking for new hobbies. They were confined to their homes. So people were trying to figure out things to do. And a lot of people got into beekeeping then. So uh, that was a pretty strong trend. But as of late, what I've noticed in the last, uh, oh, I guess the last couple of years on, on Google search, there have been less searches on beekeeping. Not a lot. I mean, not a lot, but it has, it's not like skyrocketing up. It uh, leveled off after COVID a few years and then a slight trend downward now because um, one of the things that, that troubles me about what's in store for uh, bees is not varroa mites because I think we have a pretty good handle on the varroa destructor mite. Um, it's more of this thing that I've shared before on live stream and that is um, some rumored statistics. I like to say rumored statistics because, you know, you can't get any real good statistics on this. People just aren't going to share it. Why do people quit beekeeping, right? People aren't going to share that. You, people quit and don't even, they, they wouldn't even fill out a report if they, if they were asked to. So I wouldn't, <laughs> I probably wouldn't. I quit stuff. I don't tell anybody. I just quit. So you don't really know, but most people can see it. I mean, I, I work with a lot of beekeepers. I've helped a lot of beekeepers start. So I get an idea of who's still doing it sometimes and who's not, how quickly they, they end their beekeeping hobby. And so I think it's pretty accurate. Most people have been hitting around the ballpark about, um, you know, let's say 100 beekeepers start keeping bees. And after four years, only four of them are still keeping bees. I think that's pretty accurate. I really do. I've heard a lot of people say that. And so this is a trend, I think, that, isn't really that big of a deal because we have this huge influx of beekeepers that continue to start new every year. That's amazing. And I don't know how many are starting new every year, but I would say probably, um, I, I think there's, you know, again, what are statistics? I read a statistics a couple of years old, about 18,000 beekeepers in the U S and, um, but anyway, I, you know, roughly let's, let's use a round number of a thousand beekeepers start every year. It could be more, it could be less. Wow. Norb, thank you for that super sticker. I appreciate that. That's a very nice gesture. Um, so a lot of people start beekeeping, let's say a thousand start. And then that means that in four years that only 40 of a thousand will be left. And here's the trend that I want to talk about the things that are kind of changing a little bit. Um, I, I really think that conferences, I really think YouTube content creators, including myself, um, vendors, conferences, um, beekeeping, beekeeping, beekeeping companies. Um, I, I really think a lot of focus is placed on those that have a lot of years experience in beekeeping. And so if you go to a lot of conferences, a lot of the speakers are um, scientists and they're doing uh, great research in beekeeping. And, but a new beginner sometimes doesn't know how to interpret all that scientific information that they hear at conferences. And I've heard people tell me at clubs, sometimes they're treated like a new beginners aren't really received well. And other people tell me they are. But I think a trend that we're seeing that uh, change a little bit now where more and more people are starting to realize that we need to accommodate the new beginner. I really do. I mean, if you just start, I mean, just go on YouTube now and start looking at different um, content creators and beekeeping on YouTube. And I know there's some that are, you know, not um, necessarily focused on beginners or new information that, that uh, on getting started, a lot of them are just showing blogs or they're, they're giving out scientific information on things. But I think, I think we see a movement of people that are flooding beekeeping, uh, new beginners that it's causing people to say, wait, 
there are more people, let me, let me put it to you this way. There are more people, I think, entering beekeeping than have been in beekeeping a long time. And I could be totally wrong, but that's just the way that I have perceived it to be by people I talk to, by our own customers, by YouTube comments where I see people making comments, hey, I'm going to start beekeeping next year. I started this year. I'm going to get a hive next year. I mean, it may just be my channel. More beekeepers find maybe my channel more friendlier to new people. I'm not sure. But, um, and I think also if you're an experienced beekeeper, I, I know some, I, I'm friends with commercial beekeepers, big time beekeepers. They're not watching YouTube. They don't need, they don't have to watch YouTube, right? So they're not watching YouTube. They don't buy equipment. Uh, you know, they, they, if they buy equipment from a bee place, they're buying it in pallets and they're buying it all in one lump sum. They're not looking through magazines, right? Big time beekeepers, they don't shop on the internet really for onesie and twosie items. They're not, they're not going online and buying a hive tool. You know what I mean? That's what I'm trying to say. I, I think, I think, uh, these, I think bee companies and, uh, all of us that are a part of social media, uh, promoting beekeeping. I think we really need to take a hard look and say, you know, we're, we're helping to feed new beekeepers information that can help them stay in beekeeping longer. And I think that's really important. I think that's going to be a real big focus that we're going to see change in 2024. Because when I started back in the nineties, um, I don't know. There wasn't as many new beekeepers near. It was nearly not enough new beekeepers back then starting like there is now. I, again, colony collapse disorder, 2006 really ramped it up. Beekeepers couldn't even, uh, bee companies couldn't even keep up with shipping out orders. People were getting into bees so much. We started our business about then and, and we knew exactly how many people were buying uh, packages and ordering our hives equipment and such. So I know what that feels like when you're just so far behind. We were making hives as fast as we could during that, this flood of new beekeepers. And we were out seven weeks behind sometimes. It was crazy how insane it was. It's not that way anymore, but we still have a majority of people coming to beekeeping that, that are new beekeepers beekeepers. So one of the other things I wanted to share, I got a lot, lot to share with you tonight. So hang tight with me here a minute. Um, but I really think the, the audience that, that we speak to on YouTube and the audience that's at conferences and the audiences that are looking through B magazines and, and I really think the majority of them have been keeping bees less than five years. That's what it really seems like to me. And I've also been studying this big gap between new beekeepers or experienced beekeepers, like one to five years, and then those that have been keeping bees for 20 years. There's not a lot of people in the middle of that. It's pretty astounding that, you know, you have your new beekeepers that have been keeping bees a little while and not many in the middle, then you have people way out there that's been keeping bees 20 years, a little bit like myself. I've been keeping bees 28 years, you know? So I'm way out there on that end, but who's been keeping bees, say, you know, 12 years or 15 years? Interesting. I wish we had hard numbers. It'd be so fun if we had hard numbers to look at. Um, so one of the other things that I, well, I wanted to mention that there's more women in beekeeping now than when I was a, starting out. Uh, well, I, I would often go to a bee club and I don't know if I ever saw a woman there at all. And I even started teaching beekeeping classes. I don't remember what year I started teaching classes, um, early 2000 and something, but, uh, I rarely had a woman beekeeper in my courses, uh, my on-site courses. But then as time went on, oh, Hey Mark, I was supposed to answer your email today. I'm so sorry. My time has ran out. Thank you, Mark, for uh, your donation tonight. I appreciate it. I'm going to answer your email. Don't, <laughs> I haven't forgotten you. And, and so when I start, when I kept te teaching classes, I would see more and more women getting into beekeeping and it was really cool to see that. And now it looks like it's 50, 50. I'm kind of excited to see a lot more young people as well. Young people are getting into beekeeping. And let's face it, man, when I started, I started in my early thirties and I was a young, I was a kid. I mean, 30 years old, I was like a little kid because all the other beekeepers 
when I would go to a club or something, man, they were like, well, to a 30 year old, they look 90. I was this young kid. So that's changing a lot. A lot of young people are in beekeeping now. That's for sure. Um, and I think that poses a big problem. And you've heard me say this today. I don't, I don't think our teaching styles are adapting to the younger generation of beekeepers and how they need to be taught, how they respond to teaching. I think sometimes we keep trying to share conference material, PowerPoint presentations and lectures and teaching methods like we've always done. And I think we need to change that. I really do. I think that's something that we're going to see the younger uh, generations uh, show us that there's a better, more effective way to relate beekeeping to them. And I think we need to be responsible and do that. It takes a little more work because you got to change your the way you approach that. And some people don't want to do that. Um, but now beekeepers have so many more options. And I may be wrong. Tell me in the comments if you think I'm wrong. But here, here's the thing. Now, you may not like it. I'm not, I'm not saying you should like it or not like it. But this is something I think that that I'm observing. And that is, there's a lot of different ways that new beekeepers receive their education than have been traditionally taught to them. Traditionally, you would have one single mentor or you would go to a bee club, you know, you'd kind of go that route or you, your bee club may offer classes and all. Do you, do you notice like I do that, Younger people today getting into beekeeping, that's not their method. They, they like social media. They prefer to be taught uh, themselves. They like, to, they like to learn. They like to teach themselves. They like to research it. They like to go online. They like to look at YouTube or look at a Facebook thing or something. They're, they're not so apt to jump in a car on a Wednesday night and drive 45 minutes to a church basement for a beekeeping club meeting there. I mean, I'm just seeing, I'm seeing that. I'm hearing people tell me that. I, I, whether you like that or not, that that is a, a change that I, I see. And I think that's one of the trends that we might see develop in 2024. I already see it now where more and more people are looking for online courses. They're looking for online mentors. They're looking for, I mean, I'm, I'm wanting to, I'm, I'm, I'm in, uh, let's say I'm getting into another hobby a little deeper. And one of the things I have to do in that other hobby is take a class to get certified in this one area. But um, to do that, I was excited to see that it's online, much of it. I have to still have to go into on-site training. Michael, thank you so much. Well, I'm not the best. I'm glad you think that. You see, you're a second-year beekeeper. Two colonies going strong. Yep, I know. I, I like that. I like it, Michael. And uh, so anyway, I need to, I need to take this course uh, online. And if they wanted me to come up there once a week, it's, it's in Chicago area. I, I, that's going to be hard on my schedule. So I can take most of it online. Woohoo! And then go up there one time, maybe just for an on-site course and a test and all. So that appeals to me and I'm an old feller. <laughs> so these things are really uh, changing. And I got a few more notes of what's changing too, but um, it's going to be an interesting model how we adapt ourselves to reach new beginners. And I think that's one of the reasons we're not holding on to them as much. Now, I know there's a lot of reasons. Some people fail. They don't, they don't want to do it again. They're wasting money trying to keep bees alive and they fail. But if we could really educate beekeepers, would they be wasting money? Would their hives be dying? Could we really teach them in such a way where it we could teach not just the science, but we could teach the art of beekeeping, the skill of beekeeping? You know, beekeeping, you can apply skill, or let me say, you can apply science to beekeeping, right? Do it scientifically by the book, cookbook science, and your bees could still fail, right? You know that, don't you? Absolutely. And so if you have, though, the skill set and kind of like, a mastery or an art of keeping bees. Sometimes the science isn't what you need. It's the skill and the mastery of looking and saying, Ooh, I can tell this hive is going through this. And so science may not help you. It may be you reading it. And I've said this before, 
It's just like a mom. I mean, you can take your, you can take your children to the doctor and your physician has been well-trained to look for problems, right? But let's face it, when a child wakes up and comes out of their room, sits down at the breakfast table, mom can look at them in the eye and say, hey, honey, do you not feel good? That's an art. That's an intuition. That's a skill. That's, a, that's something that a mom or a dad can pick up on by the eyes the, the color of their skin. And I think beekeepers are the same way. A real talented, skilled mastery of, of beekeeping beekeeper can really open up a hive. And I'm not saying get rid of science. We need science, but you need science plus. And I think that's what we really need to teach people that so that they won't drop off. They'll be able to correct problems as they come up. All right, let me talk about hives. In 2024, hives are... Uh, without the bees, just beekeeping equipment. When I started beekeeping, there was really only one type of hive. There was a Langstroth. Sure, there were other types already around. I know, you know, we had the Worry hive that uh, came out in the 50s and top bar hives and such. But for the most part, man, it was just accepted Langstroth all the way when I started. Uh, pick up a trade magazine or, you know, Date Ant, Man Lake, Better Bee or something in the 90s. Pff, it's, it's Langstroth hives, right? Rolling straw equipment, pretty much that way today for the for a big part. But haven't we seen this flood of new hives coming on to the market? I mean, it's crazy, isn't it? We had the flow hive, which it really is just a Langstroth with a different way to harvest your honey. But it's for all intents and purposes, it is its own unique hive, right? It's something that everybody says there's Langstroth, and then there's a flow hive. So we just we we categorize that as not a Langstroth. It's it's a flow hive. And then you have other hives um, like horizontal hives. Horizontal hives are really gaining traction. And they're not gaining traction as fast or as much. Thank you, uh, Erwin. I appreciate your super sticker so much. You guys are great for donating. Um, but these uh, the horizontal hives, the reason they're not gaining as much traction yet is because everybody already has a bunch of Langstroth hives. And so it's hard to buy a horizontal hive when you have enough equipment. So like if you wanted to buy another hive because you've already got 10 or 100 or 1,000 Langstroths, you're going to buy another Langstroth, right? But new beekeepers, I think, are the, are the ones that bee companies, let's face it, if you're a bee company, and you know that your sales really are are going to be seen and and purchased by new beginners. I know you got your big time commercial guys buying off of you, but your big market is really those new 1000 beekeepers that are going to be looking at your catalog after the first of the year, right? And so that's kind of what's leading the way is what people I mean, I've gone to bee clubs and they pass out uh Date Ant, Man Lake magazines, everybody. So whatever they see is what they buy. And so if if you don't have a magazine in front of you with a whole bunch of lengths, a whole bunch of horizontal hives in there from different horizontal hive manufacturers or a whole bunch of flow hives in those trade magazines like that, your people aren't going to go on, go crazy after them. But even, even though that's the case, people are still going crazy after these horizontal hives. It's a big thing. Now, a few years back, people went crazy on top bars and everybody had to have a top bar. And I've seen that kind of wane a little bit. I really have. If you leave a comment, if you've seen top bar hives kind of fall off a little bit, but boy, there was a, we sold, we made and sold top bar hives, a lot of them back then when that trend hit, but people quickly kind of abandoned that. I know that some of you still love them. Many of you still buy them and use them and think they're the best way. I understand we're always going to have a crowd of people that love these uh, unique type of hives. And then we have different variations. I mean, oh, we also have the Slovenian. I want to get a Slovenian hive. That looks good. Basically kept in a building, I think. I think it only has one deep and then you put your super on there. It's kind of like inside. Some of you may run these Slovenian hives. Um I'll learn how to say it a little bit better and then I'll get one. But I, I think those are interesting hives. They really are. They're unique. I've seen cool things with Slovenian hives, um, top bar hives. I mentioned that. Um, a lot of slight variations of the Langstroth. Those are hitting the market big time too. And I think in, we're going to see more of that. We have the Appy May, which is a Langstroth. We have the Keeper hive, which is a 
pretty much a Langstroth that I did a video about those guys. Kind of a can't wait to get one. I'm hoping to pick one up at North America. Oh, I actually held my thumb up and made a little bubble appear like that. I can do this and let you guys know. Let me get it over here. That I love you. Where are my hearts at? Put them over here. There they are. Love you guys for watching. I got to turn this hand gesture off. If I give two thumbs down, it starts raining. Look at this. <laughs> I know. I didn't get that. Even, the Siri, even Siri's talking to me. I'm having a mess over here. So um, we have all these different hives like the Apime and Keeper's Hive, uh, different kind of Langstroth, variations of Langstroths coming in. So we have a lot going on with that. Um, beekeepers. Then I want to talk, we talked already about companies. Let's see. Uh, okay. Oh, here I want to talk about this. So another trend that we're seeing that's crazy. This is like going crazy. Now, I, I'm one of these guys that started beekeeping and I decided to make my own hives way back, I think in early 2000 something because I didn't want to pay shipping. I was poor. And so I made my own hives and I made my first hive, followed a bunch of, you know, typical stuff. I got off, I don't know, some bee form, how to make a hive or something. And Painted it, put it together, painted it. It looked great. It looked, I thought it, I thought I did a great job. I've always been a carpenter a little bit, so it's not a problem. But so eBay back in early 2000 was really going strong. And so I put that for sale on eBay, that hive that I built. Didn't really want to give it away because I needed it. But <laughs> I thought, what the heck, I'll see if, you know, back then you bid it, you, you would bid on it. And people bid on my hive. And I became a power seller on eBay in 30 days selling beehives, assembled beehives. And so I'm one of these people that started beekeeping, started a beekeeping company, starting started selling nukes and packages and equipment, make manufacturing beekeeping equipment, selling queens, blah, 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 right? Honey, all that stuff. I'm seeing that, I mean, I was doing it back in early 2000 and, and it was kind of not that many people around. I was one of the few people selling packages in my area. Now packages of bees are sold by every club and everybody around every corner, even like tractor supply stores, farm stores, they sell packages of bees in the spring. They're everywhere. You can buy a nucleus around every corner. It's crazy. I think we're going to see more of that. So what we're seeing, what I'm seeing a trend is people that get interested in beekeeping and then they expand into a beekeeping business really quick. I have a lot of friends in beekeeping that are now running beekeeping businesses. They're, you know, Man Lake distributors or dealers. They're, they're, are they're make, making their own equipment. They're charging people to dip, you know, wax dip their boxes. They're selling things. They're buying and selling. It's amazing. It's not a bad thing. Competition has always been good, but I see that going to be growing a lot more. You'll see that at the North American Honeybee Expo. When you go through the vendors, you'll see a lot of people there that are um, beekeepers that started these companies. And so that's a big trend now that's starting to really gain a lot of traction. And it is going to be interesting to see how that goes. You know, anytime you start a business, there are those who can make it and those who can't make it. And uh, there are those who go a few years and it looks like they're having a good go at it, uh, but then it gets really hard. It's a lot of hard work to make a bee business. But um, all of these things are really changing. I mean, it's so easy today to get a nucleus of bees, a package of bees. Um, the market is so saturated. The market in beekeeping is so saturated. Where do you buy your hives at? I mean, do any of you buy them on Amazon? Amazon sells hives, hive equipment, and um, there are, there are a lot of um, probably local places near you, maybe a bee store near you that sells hives. Um, a lot of people tell me that when they want to buy a flow hive, they buy a knockoff flow hive to save a lot of money. They're buying them on Amazon or something. A lot of people tell me that some things don't fit, some things don't work. But anyway, I mean, when I started beekeeping, man, there was like, no kidding, I'm serious. And at least that's all I knew. I, I knew there was a Walter 
Kelly Company in Kentucky. I bought all my stuff in the 90s from Walter Kelly. Leave a comment if you know what I'm talking about. I don't, I think they've conglomerated into something else now. I don't know if I don't keep up to date on that, but Walter T. Kelly, you know, man, it was crazy. And of course, there was Date Ant, been around forever, big company, Man Lake, Better B, and I'm I'm forgetting some other names, but those those three were the ones when I started that I looked through their catalog to decide what I needed to buy. I didn't know anybody else that was doing it. And they would, well, you know, early internet too. So Walter Kelly, Man Lake, Date Ant. But you look at it now, these companies that were once really big companies, they have really stiff competition now, like Man Lake and Date Ant, because they have, now we have all these mom and pop companies of beekeepers starting up here in Illinois, just north of me, two very large uh, beekeeping companies that are started by individuals. And, and just to the, uh, let's see, the east of me, another large family company selling hives, equipment, nukes, packages. Huh, I got to stop. It's, it's really insane. It really is. So that's going to be a big change we're going to see in 2024 uh, of what we're seeing. But the big, the big takeaway from what I want to share you, with you guys tonight is really my interest in helping new beginners, one to five year uh, beekeepers, because I don't want you to quit. And it's easy to quit because uh, it can be very frustrating, go through a lot of problems. You can have a lot of hardships with your bees up and down. And, you know, like I've mentioned here on live stream, sometimes it's real expensive to keep bees. I've seen, uh, I've been looking at package prices for packages in, uh, in the spring. And, I mean, they're pushing 200 bucks for a package of bees. I think I used to sell them for $50. <laughs> I used to sell a beehive, uh, two deeps and a super for $79 with the frames assembled and painted. $79. Now they're three or four hundred dollars. So that's a that's another thing that is gonna really probably start being shown up in, in beekeeping too. Is a lot of people getting started in beekeeping don't have a thousand dollars to pour into a couple of hives and a couple of packages of bees and all the supplies and all. And I think that's going to be a little tough too, for people to uh, put money into hobbies like this, they can do it without them. So um, I hope this has been um, somewhat interesting for you guys to think about, but here's the takeaway. Let's all do our part in helping new beekeepers, young beekeepers that haven't been doing it very long, Let's be careful when we get into our circles, not just to hang out in our groups of friends that they, they're they they're like us or, you know, like, I know all about this. I want to talk to this guy about this, you know, this new product, this new thing, this, I want, I want to talk about this new research. I want to talk about this new hive. And the new beginner just wants to know, hey, I, I want to know what I do with this thing and what it's called. You know, I don't even know. Oh, that's a queen of clear. Oh, is that what you call it? I had no idea. No one ever told me. You know what I mean? So let's not assume that new beginners know what you know. We all need to do our part when we're gathered together in groups, clubs, conferences, to be a little more open-minded, open-hearted to new beginners. And I know we can't mentor everybody. There's too many coming in, but we can do our part to help new beginners a lot. Thank you, Sally, for your super sticker. So nice of you. So for me, I'm really encouraged to have a YouTube channel where so many of you are probably one to 10 year beekeepers and you're finding information helpful on my channel. That really makes me so happy because that's really what I want to do. My, my saying that I, that I often say my, I guess my passion, if I had to word it is I want to help you make fewer mistakes and keep healthier bees. Oh, wouldn't it be nice to have a friend like that? Can I be your friend in beekeeping and help you make fewer mistakes and keep healthier bees. Wouldn't it be nice to have a friend like that? Man, <laughs> I would have loved to have a friend like that when I started. I had nothing, nothing. Golly. So, um, oh, speaking of that, I have a new thing that I've launched on my YouTube channel. And I've been, I've had a YouTube channel since 2008, a couple of years after YouTube started. Can't believe I've never done this, but I've never had membership. And so I've got membership on my YouTube channel. And it really boils down to, it gives you a little more uh, 
emojis when you're on live stream tonight like this. If you were a member, you you would have a choice to have different emojis by your name. And, um, and then also you could become um, a supporter of my channel by, uh, you know, I thought about this. I've been keeping bees for since 2008. I've made 640 videos over 28. Well, I don't think I've been on that. I've been on, I've been on YouTube for 15 years. So I've made 640 videos in a decade and a half. I'm tired people. <laughs> no, not really, but I, I work hard. I really do. And so it, it takes a little bit of money to make the mission, you know? And, um, uh, so if you can support my channel that way, so many of you do, I, I made a video uh, a couple of days ago that has over 8,000 views today, December tips and a very kind lady, Frances, I, Frances Moore, I think she, she left a super thanks of, uh, on, on the video. If you watch a video at the bottom, you can leave a little thanks and make a donation and oh gosh, that's so nice here. So Anything you do like that, it helps so much because, you know, I'm staring into a camera that was expensive. I'm talking to a microphone that was expensive. So these memberships will help support my channel. So if you want to do that, that's great. If you can't because times are tough or that's just not your interest, I still love you. I'm still happy that you're a member of my Beak Squad. It's uh, still the same, okay? So, but those of you that can help, really do appreciate it. All right. All right, so let's have let's have times of uh, answers and questions tonight. Maybe some of you are new beginners and struggling with some things that you want to know more. Wow, I'm scrolling through the comments to get to the bottom, and there is a lot. I have fallen asleep, didn't stay down at the bottom. There we go. Uh, so yeah, good to good to answer any questions that you might have in our last 20 minutes here tonight. You getting ready for North America Honeybee Expo? I'm looking forward to going there, January the fourth through seventh. June bug. Will a robber guard or the metal mouse guard that has the pull down piece work as a wind block? No, I want wind. I want a wind block to block the wind that would hit the entire hive. Make it tall enough where it keeps all the wind off of the hive. That's what a wind block is to me. That does help a lot. Bees don't have to work so hard to keep that. Um, more cooled or more warmed up. Yep. Good to have a mouse guard on, but uh, let's you know, let's use something else for for wind block. I like to use bell of straw, build something. I thought about taking some T posts, I think they're called, and pound them in the ground, and then put some put them on put pallets uh, through those T posts for wind blocks. When ordering packages of bees from other states. Can the bees have weakened immune systems from traveling and being unfamiliar to different eco ecosystems? Yes and no. Um, it's not the best thing. You know, if I had a choice, if I was a bee <laughs> and you wanted to put me in a, a small box with 10,000 of my brother, of my sisters and some of my brothers <laughs> and, uh, Give me a little bit of food and in the chew on for a while for six days. Make me stay in that box. Can't go to the bathroom or anything. Yeah, I'm not going to, I'm not going to be very healthy about that. It works and bees do fine. Don't get me wrong. It's not unhealthy, but if you have a chance to buy a nucleus, that's going to be far better because you're just taking the heart of a hive, putting it in five frames and getting it that way. But usually bee package bees do really well. Don't get me wrong, but I know shipping them, um, the shipping is what really hurts bees. It really does. They're not always, they're overheated or they're they're in too cold of climates when they're being shipped. So that's what's hard on bees when they're shipped. It works. I mean, don't, don't feel like you're getting ripped off if you're going with the package. It works. It's worked forever. Good question though. Hey, Jeff, wax boxes, go there. People are asking. I guess you're talking about wax dipping. Um, I'll go with, uh, wax, waxing your boxes. Um, thank you, Angela, for your super sticker. Appreciate it. Um, so wax dipping is a combination of, of beeswax and other waxes that you basically boil up to, I think 300 degrees Fahrenheit. And then, uh, you should, I know some people only do it about three minutes. I think it should be done 10 minutes because I read in a recent study that I was looking at that 
that even would kill American fowl brood spores if you boil it in wax like that at 300 degrees for 10 minutes. I don't know. I, I'm not a wax dipper, um, but I do I do admire people that do it. It does what it does. It actually forces the liquid out of the wood, even though your wood looks dry. It has moisture in it, and then when it starts to um, kind of dry out, I guess, or you you dip them the water comes out and the, the wax goes into the wood. So it really is one of the most phenomenal ways to preserve your equipment. Look at my hair. <laughs> if I bought a hive now at my age and didn't even paint it, left it in Illinois anyway, left it out there in the yard, which I do, that box will outlive me. <laughs> so I guess if I was a younger guy, I'd be dipping my equipment, but I don't know. Yeah, it's a good thing. It's beautiful. That's the big thing. It's beautiful. It works. It preserves. If you can find somebody to do it, a lot of people started out doing it. Now, not so many people are doing it. So you got to find somebody to do it for you. It really does work. Oh, Angela. Yeah. From Las Vegas, new beekeeper. Bees obtained August from wild hive this year. Brood box full, too deep added, but no drawn comb. Second box added. Should we remove second box going into winter? Yeah, I think I would. If there's no no drawn comb out there, let's get it off of there. Bees aren't going to be doing anything in there. And uh, that way you can condense all your bees down to the to frames they've pulled out. Yep. Always try to remove boxes that just aren't drawn out for winter. Hey, Gary, how are you? If you leave a super on top of a hive through winter, is it likely that the queen will move up into the super and start laying in the spring? Absolutely. Mine do that like crazy. There's no way to keep her out of there. All the bees move up there to eat that honey. They'll eat a frame or two and then, aha, it's empty. And so there's the queen laying. All you got to do, though, is once you come out of winter, what I do is uh, usually just drop, you know, move the queen down, pick her up, move her down back into the deep, put a queen excluder under that super. When all those bees emerge out of that super, they're just going to fill it up with honey after that. So yeah, she's likely to go up there. You'll be lucky if, if she doesn't just count on it. Hey, Kevin, how are you? You placed a broodminder temp and humidity monitor in our hive, but we cannot find anywhere that a normal range is to compare the results we're getting. Would appreciate any help you can share. Oh yeah. Um, should have been, I thought that literature with broodminder would have addressed that. Uh, typically beehives are around 92 degrees. You're going to think the inside temperature is going to be around 92 where the bees are. The brood nest area is Fahrenheit. Humidity is going to be, it's going to vary, but in the brood nest area, you'd think around 50% humidity. It would be good. And I think you have a scale with that as well. Scales all over the board too. But that, that temperature, you know, a long time ago, I put all those sensors in my hives and, hooked it up to a laptop and ran it all winter, got all that information out. It varies with the outside um, humidity. The inside humidity changes according to the outside humidity too. So um, it's all over the board. Bees, But bees have a pretty good way of keeping it where they want it, but it will change. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't stress, Kevin, over, you know, something's wrong. My, my temperature is too cold, too hot. Um, it depends on where the sensor is. That's a big thing. They're not going to really heat up anything too far away from the cluster. Um, yeah. I still have some warm days, 50s and 60s. I'm afraid of keeping one-to-one -one sugar water um, and it dripping cold on them at night. Yeah. Um, one-to-one -one sugar water on top of a hive shouldn't really drip. But I understand what you're saying. Sometimes those lids, the holes get too big, they rust out, or maybe that's not sealed off good and it would drip. But if you're really concerned, and, and uh, I would take them off temporarily and not be worried about it. But usually I'm not too concerned. I I, I usually will sugar feed my bees, but um, once the temperatures get to where they are now, I'm not feeding them liquid anymore. Yeah. Good question. Hi, Linda. What's the best, easiest way to clean metal queen excluders for use next season? Oh, you're not going to like this one. Yeah. And all of none of you will like this. I kind of learned this from commercial beekeepers. You just throw them in a big fire pit and you burn them. Isn't that awful? You know, if they're metal, 
I, I did that for years. Now, what it does, it kind of gets rid of the, they'll rust a lot easier once you burn them. It changes the coating and all, but it's so quick and easy just to burn them. Put them on some fire and all the wax, all the propolis, everything just burns off of them. And then you're free to just, wow, have a nice uh, queen excluder. Otherwise, you're scraping forever. It's so hard. I don't know if you want to burn yours. It's going to make it look bad. Wow, Castle Hives. Hey, Brian, you became a YouTube member on my page. I appreciate that. Oh, my. I, I don't know what to say. Good to see you. And uh, Brian, I wanted to tell you, I saw where you made this honey in a whiskey barrel. And um, I went on your web page, your new web page, castlehive.com, to buy some of that whiskey barrel honey. It was all sold out. What's going on over there? You're going to have to bring, sneak me in a little sample over to, in January at the conference. Hey, Alex, how are you? Top five rookie mistakes. Oh, boy. Let's see. I get a pen. I never have a pen on me. Here's a pen. Top five. Number one, first mistake beekeepers make. Uh, they have not been educated as thoroughly as they need to be. That's a big mistake right there because education answers really all four, right? But, you know, you got you to gotta get as much education as you can. Read a lot of bee books, take beekeeping courses, classes. That's the best way to do it. Don't depend so much on just learning on your own. Now, I have a lot of YouTube videos, and I know a lot of you people, a lot of you feel that if I watch all of David's YouTube videos, I'll be an expert. You know what? There's 640 of them. And how are you going to find them? I mean, they're just scattered everywhere. It's, you know, but if you can take a class, it's more organized. If you take one of my classes online, they're organized, they're structured, and it flows better into your mind. So don't make the mistake of not being educated. Number two, uh, put your focus on controlling mites. Really drill down and figure out how you can control mites and other pests, such as small high beetle, if you live in those uh, states like I do that have small high beetle, um, they'll they'll take out a hive. So you've got to learn pests and diseases. That's a big thing on that. Uh, number three, I think um, constantly learning new things about bees. So don't just learn the, the few things that you have to know to get by, but learn extra things like maybe I need to learn how to um, raise Queens. Maybe I need to learn how to, uh, collect swarms off of a tree. Maybe I need to learn how to split hives. What are my different options for splitting? That's going a little bit extra in beekeeping and not just throwing them in the box and hoping, hoping they'll survive and do okay. Uh, number four, a big mistake. I think that, uh, beekeepers often make in beekeeping is thinking that, their way is the only way. So that's, I did that. You know, you, you get a little information in your head and then you think, okay, I got it figured out. I don't need to know anything more. Everybody else is wrong. It's my way or the highway. Be open-minded because there's always new things to learn and beekeeping. So always try to uh, learn new things. And number five, that big mistake, number five, here it is, Alex. People quit. That's a big mistake to quit beekeeping. It really is. Don't quit because once you quit, you're done. But if you have failure, if you have these opportunities where you say, I don't want to do this anymore, but you keep doing it, you learn how not to have the failures. So by staying in the game, you gain more knowledge. So don't quit. All right. That's five at the top of my head. Hey, Kevin, thanks for your super sticker. All right. Appreciate it. Give a thumbs up to Kevin here. Oh, he got fireworks. <laughs> wow. Here I am. That's crazy. Uh, Southern California temp 60. Put a wet super on double deeps to clean up. Bees filled it again. Should I put another super and leave until spring harvest again? Wow, really? That's really great. Let me explain. See, this is a new beekeeper stumper here. If you're brand new to beekeeping, you may not know what a wet super is. You think he left it out in the rain. No, that's not what that means. This is how we need to talk to new beginners. See, I'm helping you guys learn. We need to say things like a wet super is when you take your honey super off, you harvest it, spin all the honey out, but you can still see that, you know, you got it all out, but it's still wet. You can still see residue of honey in the cells. So we call that a wet super. Put it back on the same hive, 
that wetness of honey in open cells attracts bees to fill it up again. Wow, brilliant, isn't it? Who would have ever thought? So he, uh, they did that, and they filled it up again. So now they're wondering, should I just leave it on there and put another one on? Sounds like they're bringing in a lot of nectar where you're living. So anytime bees are bringing in honey, put supers on. Go for it. Absolutely. That's good to hear. Send me a jar too. <laughs> oh, prospecting with disabilities. Uh, how big should my hive opening be in the winter? Can I use my entrance reducer? I have an alternate exit on the candy board. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I always like to keep something open at the bottom sometimes. Um, the, the top of an entrance on a winter be kind board is my lifesaver. It really is. I don't have to worry about it getting blocked with dead bees. I don't have to worry about mice getting in there. So I've been known to cover my bottom board completely up if I've got a winter be kind board on the top. Hang on, I got one for you. I'm trying not to tear up my studio when I do this. So this winter be kind has this notch right here. <laughs> and uh and I think it's important to, uh, when you put it on your hive, it'd be upside down like this. And so the bees, this would be your top, top box. And so the bees can go in and out of here. They actually take cleansing flights. I didn't expect that back when I invented this. They actually take cleansing flights and poop and come right back in. Now poop on the front of their hive and it's you know, really cold weather. It's amazing. So um, I think that's uh, a winner on bees going in and out of the hive not having to go all the way down to the bottom because oftentimes a cluster is up here and they're not going to break cluster to go down there and go outside the hive. So um, to answer your question, if you want to do both, I would certainly use these, um, the biggest entrance. Let me put this down. I used to say use the smallest entrance in the wintertime on an entrance reducer cleat. But the reason I don't like that small three quarter inch opening is because it can get clogged up so quickly with snow, dead bees. So the wider that entrance is, um, I like to use the wider one in the winter, but make the hole upwards so that the bees can walk over other bees to get out and not so much clog up. But I don't know, um, unless a lot of bees die all at one time, um, your bees are pretty good about cleaning out dead bees off the bottom board. Yep. Good question though. Oh, the bourbon barrel will be bottled on February the 1st. Your name is on a bottle. Whoa, look at that. Thanks, Brian. Wow. Now, is my, my name going to be on the bottle of honey or the bottle of bourbon? <laughs> Send me both. <laughs> I really don't like bourbon that much. It doesn't really do much for me. Oh, that's good. Thank you. Hey, David. Good to see you. Thanks for your super sticker tonight. I appreciate that. You guys are kind to donate. You really are. Oh, wow. Hey, Darlene. Uh, yeah, Darlene says, hi, David. Where is the conference in January? Oh, I'm so sorry that you don't know. I wasn't very good at explaining that. Uh, it's been promoted a lot on my YouTube channel. Uh, this is called the North American Honey Bee Expo, and it's in Louisville, Kentucky, January the 4th through the 6th. And I believe they're still selling tickets. And I'm sure Jessica or Sherry is going to pop up that website so you'll know exactly where to go. Oh, <laughs> they're busy. But anyway, it's like N-A-H-E-B, whatever, North, North American Honeybee Expo dot com. It's some, just look it up. Just Google North American Honeybee Expo, uh, Darlene, and you'll see a link to that. You can get in there. Hope you can make it and, and hope you can meet me there because I'm I'm speaking at the conference and I'm having a uh, also a, a booth there. So we'll be able to see you guys there. And uh, that'd be great. We're also asking you to consider buying a Beak Squad shirt or hat. You can order those from our website and then you can pick them up at the conference. Um, so keep that in mind too, that'll help you out. Yeah, I think they're busy looking up questions now. I've got a time for a couple more questions. Wow, the hour went so fast. The killer bees. Oh, yeah. Hi, David. If you would like the, if you would like, to capture a swarm, is it best to elevate the swarm trap? And if so, optimal height. Tom, Dr. Tom Seeley did a lot of research on that optimal height. Can't remember right now. I always feel like about 20 feet off the ground, something like that is a good um, spot for me. Um, 10 to 20 feet on a swarm trap, um, probably. But yeah, always best to have it off the ground for sure. Absolutely. Put a little 
um, swarm commander, some lemon scent in there. It'd help a lot too. Michael, how important is it to mark all of your hives different? Um, not all that important, really. Um, I, I guess you're thinking it might help your bees find their way home if they're marked differently. It would if you're installing packages for the first time. The new packages would like to, not so much colors, but if you could slap a big circle on one, a triangle on the other, square on another, or something like that, they go by shapes a lot better. They'd find their home better. But for the most part, not perfect at it, but most part, bees are really good at finding their own home. They really are. Many years I kept bees, four four hives on a pallet. And so we didn't worry about it. They they found which which hive was theirs that close together. Hey, Eric, have had bees chewing into the insulation on my winter bee kinds um, even before they eat up the candy. What's up with that? Okay, uh, Eric, I'll tell you what happens oftentimes. They won't eat through that. It should be, a, it's a metal. It's a metal insulation and they won't eat through it unless it gets a slightest little scratch on it or a cut. And that's when they'll eat through it. So if you're refilling your own, I, I always recommend people buy metal tape, like duct tape, not duct tape, but tape you use for duct work, metal tape, and then tape over any holes that might be in that metal so that the candy doesn't go down in there. If the candy gets down in that foam, they're just going to chase the candy into the foam. That's probably what happened. I've had that happen to me. They'll chew a big hole in it. They're just getting the sugar out of the foam. Yeah. We started shipping out our winter bee kinds uh, last few weeks. Any other questions? Oh, look at all the subscribe or look at all the uh, uh, tonight's donors. We appreciate that. A whole bunch of you guys still time to make a little donation. I appreciate it so much. Uh, good time to tell you that uh, we continue to appreciate all you guys for watching our YouTube channel. Ah, so fun to make YouTube uh, channels. I didn't even make a thumbs up. Come on. It did it right over top of my uh, award back there. But I appreciate you guys for watching so much. We love you guys. It's great. Um, appreciate you supporting my channel so much. So I'm hoping that the new membership uh, will be uh, um, a good way for all of us to stay a little more connected and support each other as well. So check that out. If you look at my, uh, if you go onto my YouTube channel, you'll see underneath the video, there'll be a join button and you can just click join and see if you want to be become a member. That'd be good. Um, always check out our website at honeybeesonlive.com. And we have a special link that Sherry had up there for a minute. Thanks, Doug again, or David again. But yeah, look at that donation there. As a, some of you don't want to leave a live stream here, our live stream donation. I've tried to leave a live stream donation before on other people's uh, live stream. But for some reason, there's I have certain credit cards that won't let me do it on Google. And so we have a, a website where you guys can leave a donation too if you don't can't leave it here. Thank you, Catherine, for your $10 super sticker. Wow, that's so nice of you guys. Yep, last chance to place your Beak Squad order before um, the Honey Bee Expo coming up. There's a website to it uh, as well. So uh, get those picked up at the North American Honey Bee Expo. It's going to be a great expo. I think over 3,000 tickets sold. Top speakers from all around the world. And I do mean all around the world will be there speaking on different things about beekeeping. A lot of beekeepers are going to be there. There you go, Darlene. There's a website. NorthAmericanHoneyBeeExpo.com. Yep, that's good. So looking forward to that. It's going to be uh, a very hectic few days. That's for sure. Oh, wow. You guys are continuing to donate here at the last minute. Wow, thank you. I appreciate it. You're embarrassing me. Am I blushing? I feel like I'm blushing. <laughs> Bobblehead David always says subscribe. Look at that. Don't you love Bobble? Somebody called him Bobby Head. He's not Bobby. It's Bobble. He, he, his head bobbles. Thank you, Homer. Homer's a great one. Thank you for donating. But uh, Bobblehead David is my uh, assistant that uh, has, you, has you guys subscribe. Let me say something about subscribing, too. i got a few more minutes I want to talk about. Yo, oh, it's 8 o'clock. But um, last year about this time, I earned my 100,000 subscriber uh, silver play button. And that was just great for like two days. I just held it. I slept with it in the bed. 
No, not really. Sherry wouldn't let me do that, but I, I loved it. And uh, already this year, we've already gained um, since then uh, 30,000 more subscribers. So we're on our way to 131,000 subscribers this year. So I really do appreciate it. Why is subscribing important? Uh, two reasons. Number one, it encourages me because I see that you really do like my content. But number two, it, it's helpful for you because every time I make a video, if you click on that bell, it tells you I made a video. It's like, hey, David made a new video about this or that. And you can go on there and watch it. So otherwise, you're not going to know and you might miss some good stuff. So I'm working hard. I want you to see them. I don't want to work hard and for you to miss my videos. So subscribing is a big help. Always give a thumb. Always give a thumbs up too. It's on the other side. <laughs> so that's great. So you guys are awesome. I want to thank Sherry and Jessica tonight for helping me out with all of the great work that they did tonight as well. And everything has gone well on live stream. And whenever live stream works, it's always a good feeling when cameras don't go down and microphones don't crash and internet doesn't pause and all that. So I want to thank you guys for being a part of my channel. Thank you. All of you guys are so kind tonight. Wow. Now you are making me blush. i turn my lights up a little bit more. We have a special announcement coming up next week. All of you need to be here for that special announcement. I need your help with this one. It's going to be a big one. And so please uh, consider being here next week for that special announcement. It's a good thing. That'd be cool. Joshua says horizontal hives is the way to go. You know, horizontal hives have helped my back. <laughs> all right, guys, time's up for tonight. Thanks so much for joining me. Be sure and check out all my YouTube channels. Check us out at honeybeesonline.com. Remember, I love you guys. I appreciate all of you so much. You mean the world to me, and I mean that. Have an amazing week. I'll see you guys next week. How do I end this? <laughs> Here it is.